Okay, so we'll be going over the molecular biology today. Brief, in brief introduction. Uh, so DNA is it's often, you know, uh, portrayed as being associated with crime solving, paternity testing, identification of victims, uh, of disasters, and so on, and genetic tests. It can be retrieved from hair, hair follicles, blood, or saliva, except for the uh, identical twins. Each person's DNA is unique. And we have seen that any two person have one base pair in thousand that is different. And it is uh, possible to detect the differences between human beings based on their unique DNA sequences. And the DNA is the genetic material that is passed from parent to the offspring for all life on Earth. And over a thousand species and thousand individual human genomes are sequenced in their entirety. These sequences will allow us to understand the human diseases and relationship of humans uh, to the rest of the uh, tree of life. And finally, molecular genetics technique have revolutionized plant and animal breeding for human agricultural needs. And this is where the GMOs come from, genetically modified uh, organisms. And all these advances have in biotechnology depended on the basic research leading to the discovery of structure of DNA in 1953. And the research has since uncovered details of DNA replication complex processes leading to the expression of DNA, which is what proteins are, how proteins are made. And Dali is shown here. This is the first uh, cloned animal. She was a clone of her mother, I think. Um, so structure of DNA, in the, how, how was it solved? In the 1950s, Francis Crick and, uh, Crick and James Watson worked together to determine the DNA structure. And at the time, Linus Pauling had uh, discovered the helical structure of proteins using X-ray crystallography. So how is um, the helix formed in the protein? It uses the backbone and hydrogen bonds. Uh, Pauling was, at the time, also working on this, solving the structure of DNA using a different data set. Uh, that was a William Asbury's data. So in Morris Wickland's lab, Rosalind Franklin generated the scattered data on the DNA crystals, similar to image shown here. And note here, uh, a laser is being diffracted of helical spring from a pen, uh, pinpoint, uh, from a, a pen ballpoint pen, <laughs> and note the X pattern diffraction, which is almost identical to, very similar to Rosalind Franklin's data. And this is a telltale sign of a helix. So uh, Crick and Watson used Franklin's data to solve the DNA structure, but they also relied on this idea of Chargaff's rule. And that showed that four monomers in the DNA were present in equal amount as pairs. So AT were present in equal amounts, GC were present in equal amounts. So, uh, so after uh, studying all that, Paul, Linus Pauling proposed his results, suggesting that DNA was made up of triple helix. Whereas Watson and Craig proposed that double helix was the structure. And they ended up being right, and they won the Nobel Prize in 1962. So let's look. At, let's look at the uh, structure of DNA. There are two types of two types of nucleic acids: <clears throat> deoxyribonucleic acids and ribonucleic acids. The building blocks of DNA are nucleotides, which are made up of three parts: deoxyribose, phosphate group and nitrogenous base. Deoxyribo part refers to the lack of a hydroxyl group on the number two sugar, which is number two carbon either. 
on the ribose sugar. So what are the four nitrogenous bases in the DNA? There are the single ring P remedians. Those are cytosines and thymines. Then there are the double ring purines. Those are the adenine and guanine. There are the single ring pyr pyrimidines. Cytosine seen here, thymine seen here. Here are the, here are the purines, guanine and adenine. And the uh, nucleotide themselves are named after nitrogenous base. And the phosphate group on number five carbon, one, two, three, four, five carbon. And phosphate group is attached to the five, five prime carbon. This bonds with hydroxyl group with on the three prime, one, two, three prime. A carbon on the next nucleotide or the or the beginning nucleotide point and this is the how new nucleotide gets attached and these ribose phosphate link uh, forms the phosphate backbone so hydro hydroxyl group and the uh, phosphate group are making the link and one of these oxygens will disappear so Watson and Crick proposed that the DNA was right-handed double helix. And purine pairs with its own pyrimidine. So A, purine, will uh, pair with T, thymine, pyrimidine, and G with C. These are complementary. And this is the basis for the Chagas rule. A pairs with T. Amount of A and T are the same. Same with G and C. G uh, pairs with C using three hydrogen bonds. It's shown here. One, two, three hydrogen bonds are used to pair guanine to the cytosine, whereas only two hydrogen bonds form the form between thymine and adenine. And two strands of DNA are anti-parallel, meaning five prime to three prime complements with three prime to five prime. Or so here's the five prime end going to the three prime end. On the other strand, five prime is down here and moves up to three prime layer. So the diameter of the uh, DNA is u is uniform because there is always this pair of one ring pairing with two rings. In ribonucleic acid, RNA is also a polymer of nucleotides. RNA has ribose as opposed to deoxyribose. That's because it contains the hydroxyl group at the number two carbon. It, and it uses uracil instead of thymine. And RNA are single strand, then come in three types. There's the messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. There's also single or uh, small interfering RNAs, but we're not going to talk about that. So all three are uh, involved in protein synthesis, starting with the DNA code. So DNA is the working molecule that must be replicated when cell divides, and it must be read to make the RNA and protein, which is what uh, mainly carries out the functions of the cells. And the DNA obviously needs to be protected and packaged, and is very long. It's about two meters long if you were to uh, stretch it out, and that's just in a single human cell. And the DNA for the cell must be packaged to fit and function within the cell that is not visible to the naked eye. Most of uh, uh, and it's obviously located here in the nucleus. The nucleolus is the location where ribosomal RNA is made, and the ribosome is synthesized. The chromatin is various state of condensation of the DNA. Here's the prokaryote DNA. It's, it's not shown as a circular DNA, but it's actually circular. That's just coiled up in a region called nucleoid. And the most prokaryotes have very simple circular DNA. E. coli has about 4.6 million base pairs. And that's about 1.6 millimeter if stretched out. 
So how does this fit into the uh, E. coli genome is twisted beyond double helix into a supercoil in the nucleoid. But eukaryotes have a uh, linear DNA molecule, so they have to use different packing strategy to fit their DNA into the nucleus. And Marie Daly, Arthur Mirsky discovered the uh, lysine-rich histones in contrast to arginine-rich histones. And it's these histones that DNA is wrapped around. And that forms the nucleosome, which is linked to the next nucleosome by a short DNA free of histones. So here's a DNA double helix shown here. That's about two nanometers. If it's wrapped around the histone to form this nucleo, uh, to form individual part of the nucleosome, that's about 10 nanometers. And once the nucleosomes are coiled into chromatin fiber, that diameter is about 30 nanometer. So these are basically uh, beads on a string, which is about 10 nanometers width. <clears throat> so nucleosomes will compact into fibers, and which further condenses to be about 300 nanometers in uh, diameter. At the metaphase, when the chromosomes are the most condensed, that width is about 700 nanometers. And the interface, during the interface, chromosomes condense, decondense and reveal dark staining regions and the light staining regions. Dark regions have the non-active genes near the centromere and the telomeres. Light regions have active genes with DNA packaged around nucleosomes, but for, are not further compacted. So how does DNA replication occur? Replication obviously occurs during the S phase or the synthesis phase of the cell cycle before it, before it enters either the mitosis or meiosis. And A pairs with T, like I said, C pairs with G because strands are complement, complementary to each other. So A, G, T, C, A, T, G, A will pair with the complementary sequence down here. So this complementary or complementarity allows the recreation of the other strands. And each strand is a template with a new strand. And the new strand will be complementary to the parental or the old strand. And the new double strand has one parental and one new daughter strand. We call this semi-conservative model of DNA replication. So shown here, here's the parental. One copy is preserved at the parental and new daughter uh, strands are synthesized. So let's look at that in a little more detail. This involves very many, many enzymes and proteins. So eukary eukaryotic DNA is wrapped around histones in the nucleosomes. How does it know where to begin? It begins, um, it has three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. And it knows where to begin because origin, initiation occurs at the origin of replication. And that is a very specific DNA sequence. There, uh, so certain proteins bind to the uh, origin of re uh, replication, and then helicase unwinds the DNA. Double helix will supercoil if helicase does not unwind the DNA. And here's a helicase shown here at the at the end of this replication fork. And there are two Y-shaped, one, two Y-shaped uh, replication for uh, forms starting at the origin. So they initially started here, the origin. And then they extend away on both strands in both directions. So it's shown here, it's leading. This is the leading uh, strand. Here is the other leading strand. And eukaryotic cells use multiple origin of, rep of replication starting at many different places. So how does the actual elongation process occur? That's the process where polymerase as the nucleotides at the three prime end of the elongating 
uh, chain, not the template like the book says, there's an error. And the DNA polymerase needs the RNA primer to start off the elongation, but the RNA primer is replaced with deoxynucleotides. So here's the RNA primer and the DNA polymerase is synthesizing this leading strand from five prime to three prime direction. So that this template must have the complementary three prime here and five prime here. Five prime direction here. And the, this strand here is the logging strand. We'll discuss this uh, in more detail. So one uh, strand is replicated continuously down the replication port. That's the leading strand. And strand is complementary to three to five prime uh, parent strand. There's another error in the text. So five prime, five prime to three prime, three prime is over here. So the leading strand is the continuous strand. Lagging strand, template is five prime to three prime direction. Template is five prime here, three prime here. DNA, uh, so uh, the lagging strand, DNA polymerase has to extend of three, three prime end of the ribose. So if it's if the orientation of strand or template strand is five prime to three prime here, there, uh, DNA synthesis must occur in this direction. So that's why the lagging strand is synthesized in short fragments or Okazaki fragments. Uh, here's the RNA primer, and that whole thing that's been replicated is referred to as the Okazaki fragment. So the termination, as the synthesis ensues, the RNA primers are um, uh, replaced with deoxyribonucleotides or deoxynucleotides in both leading and lagging strands. So these RNA primers will be excised out, cut out, and replaced with DNA uh, deoxyribonuclease. But they're not joined. There are these gaps. They're not covalently linked using phosphodiester bond or phosphate backbone. So those gaps have to be sealed, and that is done by an enzyme called DNA ligase. Without this enzyme, Okazaki fragments cannot be joined. So there's another problem with DNA synthesis. Since DNA polymerase adds uh, nucleotides in five prime to three prime duration, on the leading strand, it will continue until the very end, including the tel uh, telomere here. But on the lagging strand, there's no room to replicate this end because there has to be ribo RNA primer that has to come here where the sequence doesn't reside to replicate these sequences. But there's there's no place to put the RNA primer to provide the three prime end. So each, each replication cycle, the telomere shortened as a result of it. And the solution to that is to use an enzyme called telomerase. And the telomerase actually has RNA that is complementary to the telomere sequences. Here are the telomere sequences. And telomerase enzyme possesses an RNA sequence that is complementary to that telomere. And here's a template strand. This is the lagging strand that's, that's uh, shown. So it needs to proceed that way. It, it needs to come here and put the primer there or here. But since there's no room, telomerase has to come along and provide the three prime end. Typically, uh, telomerase is found active in germ cells other adult stem cells and some cancer cells. And they're not uh, active in somatic cells. So each cycle telomere, telomere will shorten. And example of somatic cell would be your skin cell. 
And wh what happens when you age? You wrinkle. And that's, we think that's one of the reasons why you age. And Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for discovering this process. Um, this is a little too much information, but it shows, um, yeah, let's, let's skip this. It just need to know that the telomere or, or telomere is replicated by an enzyme called telomerase that possesses RNA sequences to provide the three parameter. Uh, so then how does uh, DNA replication work in prokaryotes? Prokaryotes have circular genome, and it doesn't need as complex a mechanism as eukaryotes. For instance, the E. coli genome is only about 4.6 million base pairs, and all of its uh, genes can be replicated in about 42 minutes. That's about 1,000 nucleotides per second that's being added. And it also starts at the original replication, and it also proceeds in both directions. So what are the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic replications? So origin, prokaryotes have single original re replication, eukaryotes use, use multiple. How fast does it go? Rate of re replication, about 1,000 nucleotides per second. For eukaryotes, it's about 50 to 100 nucleotides per second. Chromosomes themselves are circular versus linear. Telomerase is, is not present in prokaryotes, but pre present in certain eukaryotes cells. So <clears throat> that's the replication in detail. Um, you can DNA polymerase as it replicates the DNA can make mistakes. And DNA polymerase itself prevents the mistakes by proofreading every new added uh, base. And if incorrect bases are placed, and then the polymerase uh, with the uh, uh, if incorrect bases are replaced with the correct uh, base, <laughs> I can't speak. Then the polymerization will continue. So what it does is that if it's wrong base that's being added, it's confirmation changes, and the DNA polymerase backs up and cuts this wrong nucleotide out. That's the that's what we call three to five prime exonuclease activity. Exo outside nuclease cuts the nucleotide three prime to five prime because it's going from three prime here to five prime there. So that's the direction of movement. So most mistakes that it makes are fixed, but if it doesn't, mismatch repair mechanism turns up. So what is that? Mismatch repair enzymes, these are separate from DNA polymerases. They recognize wrongly incorporated uh, enzymes or uh, pairs, and then it just cuts it out, re replaces it with a correct base, like here. And of uh, certain mistakes, Sometimes what happens is in, if you have thimer next to a, a, another thimer, and if it's uh, exposed to UV, those two thimer, thimer, thimer pairs will form a covalent bond. We call that thimer dimers, thymine dimers. And thymine dimers are uh, replaced using, repaired using special type of repair, and that is called the nucleotide excision repair. The surrounding sequences are repaired or cut out along with the mistake, and the whole thing is replaced. And some, most of these DNA damages are repaired, but if they're not, they can lead to mutations and diseases like cancer. Now we should discuss uh, uh, how DNA is copied to produce proteins, and that is called transcription. And it has to copy as messenger RNA. And messenger RNA has to be translated to protein to provide functions for the cell. And this is the central dogma of DNA, uh, biology. DNA encodes RNA, RNA encodes protein. If, if the messenger RNA is copied from five prime to three prime direction, what, which template strand do you think 
it must be using. It must be using the three prime to five prime strand. So in eukaryotes, transcription occurs in nucleus, and then messenger RNA transcript must be transported into the into the cytoplasm. Whereas in prokaryotes, transcription can just occur in obviously cytoplasm because it doesn't have a nucleus. In both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, transcription occurs in three main stages. It has to be initiated, then elongated, and has to be terminated. The initiation begins with DNA being unwound, forming a transcription bubble, which is shown here. So here's RNA polymerase, and DNA is unwound. And enzymes are the proteins involved in transcription bind the promoter region. Here's a promoter region here. Uh, upstream of the gene being uh, transcribed. And the sequence of, uh, of promoter is important for deciding if the downstream gene is transcribed at all time, some of the time, or hardly at all. And this also varies depending on genes. And sometimes there are uh, tissue, specific, tissue specific as well, <laughs> having difficulty speaking. So here's the RNA uh, being synthesized in this direction. So it is using the template strand that goes from five prime end over here and three prime end over here. So RNA sequences moving five prime end to three prime end that way. So transcription always proceeds from the template strand, which is shown as three prime to five prime. And the messenger RNA is complementary to the template, and it is identical to the non-template strand. And it is the non-template strand that codes for the genes. RNA polymerase uh, elongates the messenger RNA continuously as DNA unwinds in front and rewinds behind it. Unwinds over here, rewinds back here. And uh, obviously, because it's messenger RNA, you have to replace the thymine with the uracil. So how does termination of transcription occur? In prokaryotes, RNA uh, polymerase stalls over the repeated sequences in the template and then leaves the tem uh, DNA template and then frees the messenger RNA transcript. It's shown here. And in prokaryotes, transcription and translation occurs at the same time. And that's shown here. There are multiple ribosomes that attach to nascent, newly made messenger RNA. And translates the protein as the messenger RNA is produced. Uh, yeah, so by the time the termination occurs, messenger RNA have, uh, has already been partially translated because these processes occur at the same time. In eukary eukaryotes, however, nucleus prevents the simultaneous transcription and translation. It has to be transported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. So new messenger RNA must be processed in eukaryotes. And once it's processed, it becomes far more stable. So messenger RNA can last several hours in eukaryotes versus five seconds in prokaryotes. And messenger RNA are typically bound by RNA stabilizing proteins while being transcribed. And a special nucleotide cap is attached to the five prime end. And then poly A, uh, adenine, multiple adenine, about 200, is added to the poly 8, uh, added to the 3 prime end of the complete, completed transcripts. And then it also has to splice out these introns. This is what we call uh, RNA processing. So this shows the complete completed functional 
messenger RNA that is ready to be translated. So eukaryotic genes have protein coding sequences called the exons, like I said, exon one, exon expressed, and introns, intron, inter, repeating. Here's the intron here. So intron, introns in messenger RNA do not encode proteins and they're removed. And it's essential that all introns be precisely removed so that exons join the code for the correct amino acid. We'll discuss why, we'll see how precise it has to be because if you just miss a single nucleotide here, then the reading frame will be shifted, resulting in a, in a protein that's not functional or mutated, mutated protein. And the process of removing intron and reconnecting the exon is just called splicing. You splice. And the introns are removed and degraded while pre-nucleus, pre-RNA is still in the nucleus. So this entire process occurs in the nucleus. Now this completed RNA is ready to be transported into the cytoplasm. Then the translation can occur. Translation is the cell's most energy consuming metabolic process, make creation of proteins. And the proteins account for more uh, mass than any other molecule except water in any most in most of organisms. It's not it's not any wonder that uh, then protein functions wide variety of functions in the cell. Most of the enzymes, the vast majority of enzymes are proteins. Notable exceptions are things like RNA ribozymes. Translation or protein synthesis involves decoding the messenger RNA message into polypeptide. And the nucleotide are covalently linked, and their uh, lengths range anywhere from 50 amino acids to more than 1,000 in a uh, finished protein. So what does the protein synthesis uh, machinery look like? In addition to uh, messenger RNA template, ribosome, tRNA, and also other proteins are required for this process translation. In E. coli, there are about 200,000 ribosomes in every cell at any given time. Uh, ribosomes come in uh, large and small, small, small subunits. Here's a small subunit. Here's a large subunit. The small, it's the small subunit that binds the messenger RNA. Then large subunit binds the tRNA that is complementary. Here's a T transfer RNA. Here's the messenger RNA. So tRNA is complementary to the messenger RNA sequence. And each messenger RNA is translated by many ribosomes simultaneous, sim simultaneously in the same direction. Here's a growing peptide chain shown here. And these are individual amino acids. And it's bound to the transfer RNA that is hydrogen bonded to the complementary messenger RNA codon. Each different species have anywhere from 60 to seven, 40 to 60 types of RNA. If there are only 20 uh, amino acids, why are there so many uh, tRNAs? We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, tRNA pairs with a codon on the messenger RNA, which has what? Has the five prime to three prime sequence because it was copied off three prime to five prime template DNA se sequence. So the amino acid on the tRNA is added to the polypeptide chain. And in the tRNA charging, uh, tRNA with its anti-codon sequence, it has the three to five prime sequence, is bonded to its correct amino acid. That's the function of transfer RNA. It is to transfer the protein or amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain. So the uh, the transcription makes the messenger RNA using ACGU and encodes the information in triplet of nucleotides called codons. And the translation makes the proteins by converting each codon using one of 20 amino, amino acids. 
and the uh, relationship between this these nucleocodon and its corresponding amino acid is referred to as genetic code. <clears throat> so protein, in, in a sense, is using 20 letter alphabet. So given the th codon of three nucleotides in length, there are four possible bases for each of three positions, right? A, C, G, U, for any one of the three codon spaces. So possible combination of codon coding information is four times four times four, which is 64. Otherwise it's just 16, but there are 20 amino acids. So it's better to have redundant uh, codons, anticodons, pairs, than not enough. So given any amino acid 20 can be coded by more than one codons. So we'll see that here. So codon blank, blank, blank should code for which amino acids? Yes, it's blank for a reason. We're just gonna follow the grid. If codon was, I don't know, U, C, G, what does that U, C, G? What amino acid does that code for? First letter is U, so we're here. Second letter is C, so we're here. Third letter is G, so we're down here. And that goes for the serine amino acid. So if uh, messenger RNA codon is AUG, tRNA codon should be what? It should be complementary, so it should be T A C should be the sequence for the AUG or for the uh, uh, transfer RNA. <clears throat> AUG codes for the oops, sorry codes for the methionine and serves as the Star codon. AUG is the amino acid. AUG is the codon, rather, that sets the reading frame. So let's look at this, for instance. AUG codes for methionine. UUA codes for UUA leucine. So where am I? UUA codes for leucine. UGU codes for cysteine. AUU codes for isoleucine. But if work, if this sequence were to say lose this amino acid, this uh, nucleotide, then the next available AUG star codon is that. So it'll be methionine, then UAU, U. -U AU, which codes for the tyrosine, which is wrong. So the deletion of single nucleotide has caused a frame shift. It's a terrible, terrible situation. Virtually all species use same genetic code, but some uh, organisms use same codons for different uh, amino acids. So the mechanism, oh, Mechanism of protein synthesis. How does that actually actually occur? Obviously, it starts with again initiation, elongation, and has to terminate. Similar in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Uh, e. coli, using E. coli as an example, initiation complex forms when small ribosomal subunit binds the messenger RNA. Then three initiation factors, and uh, T, initiator tRNA will come along and binds the or combined with the small ribosomal subunit. <clears throat> the initiator tRNA is a special form of methionine possessing tRNA, which is removed afterwards, afterwards, that pairs with the AUG codon on the messenger RNA and starts the translation. Then large subunit comes and binds, and large subunit has three sites, A site, P side and E side. We'll see that next. So A side is the side that binds the incoming charged tRNA. P side 
follows the transfer RNA with growing peptide chain attached to it, P side. And then E side releases the dissociated uh, transfer RNA. But let's look at how, so here, this phenylalanine is attaching to methionine there in, in the P side. So they have a growing polypeptide chain. And this, once done, will be transferred to E side where it gets ejected out. And E side, and e -side releases the transfer RNA that gave its amino acid to the P side. And ribosome shift one codon at a time, repeating three reaction, A, P, E, at the same time. And the E shift makes the polypeptide one amino acid longer until the stuck codon is reached. And the energy for each peptide bond is actually gener generated from GTP, not ATP, guanine, triphosphate. E. coli takes about 0.05 seconds to add one amino acid. So 200 amino acid long protein can be made in 10 seconds. And ribosome is about 20 to 30 nanometers in size. One single amino acid is about 0.4 to one nanometer, meaning 200 amino acids should be anywhere from 80 to 200 nanometers. And given the fact that you can move 10 times its body length in 10 seconds. That's what essentially what it means. Ribosome is uh, 200, 20 nanometers, but 200 um, long amino acid is about 200 nanometers in length. In other words, ribosome moved 10 times its body length in 10 seconds. If car is about 14.4, 14.7 foot in length in average, and if it's moving its body length per second, and that translates to about 10 miles per hour while while carrying out all these reactions at the same time. It's a pretty rapid process. So for the cells to function properly, necessary proteins must be provided at the proper time. And this is called the gene expression, turning on the gene to produce RNA and proteins. What is expressed unit factor? That's the term from Mendel. Remember, all organisms regulate gene expression, that is what gene, when, how much of it is expressed. And cells in multicellular organisms are specialized. Think about skin, liver, muscle cell, they're all different cells. And these differences are a result of differences in gene expression. All of cells must have basic functions like metabolism of sugar to produce energy but they also have genes that are not expressed. And what are not expressed changes depending on the cell types. So cells are capable of carrying out specialized functions because they express special specific genes that are not expressed by other cells. And these cells will turn on or off a specific genes at different time or in response to changes in the environment or at different times during development of the organism. And the control of this process is very complex and many uh, malfunctions in this process leads to diseases like cancer and metabolic diseases and so on. In, in prokaryotes, transcription and translation occurs at the same time, unlike in eukaryotes. When when uh, protein is no longer needed, transcription just stops. So the prokaryotic control of gene expression is at the regulation of DNA transcription into RNA. And an example of this is lac operon. The lac operon lacs, uh, codes for three genes, lac Z, lac Y, lac A. And they code for genes to transport and metabolize lactose when you can you can imagine if there's no lactose, the lac genes are not needed because they're involved in using the lactose. So that prevents messenger RNA from binding the promoter region of 
uh, lack operon that's when there is no lactose. When there is lactose, it needs to use lactose. So these genes are transcribed and they're transcribed in large amounts if large amounts of lactose is present. So let's look at that briefly. So when lactose, usable fuel, is present, in the book it says end, end product, uh, that's wrong. It's the lactose, when present, binds the repressor and removes it from the operator. So here's the repressor here. RNA polymerase have found the promoter, but there's a repressor here. So the RNA polymerase cannot, cannot get past that in absence of lactose. But if there's a lactose present, then lactose binds the repressor and that comes off the operator and RNA polymerase can move and produce these genes. And that is what we call lactose repressor control. And if there's no lactose, obviously it just stays on. And the end product of ATP metabolism is cyclic AMP. This is the spent fuel or the end product. And it's the spent fuel, the end product, binds the cap activator. And that activates the increases the rate of transcription caused by RNA polymerase. If there is a lactose, repressor stays on, right? And if repressor stays on, cap, even if it's bound to the RNA polymerase, cannot proceed with a, a transcription because there is not, even though CAMP is uh, going up, even the cell is lo uh, losing a lot of ATP, there is no fuel to produce more ATP. So there's no point of spending energy in producing these enzymes. And that is called CAMP, cyclic AMP, or activated control. That's, that was complicated, but not as complicated as, as in eukaryotes. Eukaryotes have much more complex regulation. So RNA must be transported out into the cytoplasm. Transcription only occurs in nucleus. Translation occurs in cytoplasm. But the regulation of gene expression occurs at all levels. Epigenetic level, as DNA is loosened from histone to bind transcription factors, the expression level can be exp uh, can be regulated using special enzymes. At the transcription level, as RNA is made, post-transcriptional level, as RNA is processed and transported, at translational level, as RNA is, gets translated, post-translational level, after protein have been uh, proteins have been made. These are all different levels of eukaryotic gene expression control. So let's look at that a little more closely. It's regulated during transcription and RNA processing, and this takes place in a nucleus. And they can, transcription process shown here, RNA processing shown here, splicing, and as well as protein uh, translation, which takes in cytoplasm, takes place in cytoplasm, which is shown here. And once the protein is made, further post-translational modification can occur to the protein. Where would that occur? We have seen in cell parts, there's a thing called Golgi, which processes proteins and adds things like glycoprotein, glucose, <clears throat> sugar molecules, and lipid molecules, and so on and so forth. So comparing pro prokaryotic organisms with no nucleus, to eukaryotic organisms that has a nucleus. Transcription and translation in prokaryotes must occur or occur almost simu simultaneously. And the gene expression is regulated primarily at the transcription level. In eukaryotes, transcription in the nucleus before translation, RNA post-processing must, must occur, includes 
five prime cap, poly A tail, splicing. And the gene expression is regulated at many levels, epigenetic, trans transcriptional, post-transcriptional, translational, and post-translational. You know what? Let's, we'll end there.